Hey everybody, today Rado runs through Iki, which is a market economic simulation game on Kickstarter right now, which I'm going to do a run through today so you guys can see what it's all about and whether you'd like to back it. Now, Iki is set in 17th century Japan in Edo, or Tokyo as it's now known. And actually, it's interesting, the board is based on a very famous painting of Nihonbashi, which was the biggest market at the time. And this real world painting is apparently like 30 or 40 feet long. It's some big, gigantic mural that shows what life was like in this period and is actually a picture of thousands and thousands of merchants and customers and all kinds of stuff. And so this board is very much inspired by that big mural although it's only showing one tiny little portion of the Nihonbashi uh, marketplace. And this is where players are going to be setting up shop and trying to score the most iki, which is a, a, a Japanese phrase uh, that has, it's a lifestyle philosophy from the Edo period. It, uh, let's see, according to the rules, it stands for charm, guts, and simplicity. So that is what, how we are trying to live our life here in Edo or in this Tokyo market. So let's jump right into it. And I've already got the game set up here as a two-player game. So I am starting with eight bucks or mon as it's called. These are four and these are ones. I also have a pair of sandals and one food and three more workers I can deploy. Jen, as the second player, she's got exactly the same thing. But since Jen was the second player, she got first dibs on the starting characters. And Jen chose to hire the boiled egg peddler who provides food. We're starting with one food, which I just grabbed from my Agricola set. And by the way, I should say, everything you're seeing today is prototype. So you can go to the Kickstarter page, which you know you can hit the little eye up in the top right corner of the screen or go down in the show notes to learn what the final game looks like. But just bear in mind, everything you're seeing today, I think it's probably representative of the final look, but it is still prototype, so things might change. But anyway, so Jen's got herself set up over here in this part of the market with a boiled egg peddler who produces more food. And I have the eyeglasses salesman who produces money for whoever visits him. And you can tell this guy is mine because I've got one of my markers here. And Jen, she's got one of her markers here next to this person. Now this marker represents how experienced this shopkeeper is and over time they will get more and more experience and the further along this goes the bigger the reward Jen will get for keeping this person employed which uh, and eventually if this goes far enough if it moves four times this person ends up retiring which is a huge boon for Jen if she can pull that off uh, and actually to pull that off she's probably gonna need some help from me her opponent let's see now also there are at the beginning of the game four more personages who are merchants and, and um, artisans and all kinds of stuff that are waiting to be hired. They cause this sake peddler costs two, the monk costs four, the sandal maker costs three, and Yamabushi, uh, who is a very stalwart firefighter guy, uh, costs three as well. There's also six buildings. Every time you play, these six buildings will be out waiting to be built because they're worth a lot of points at the end of the game, but it's very expensive to build in the market. So. At the beginning of the at the beginning of a round, and this game takes place over how many rounds is it? Over twelve months, one year, plus a, a, a bonus final month as well, which is kind of like the the final bonus round in La Havre. So we're going to take place over twelve months, and these months are divided into seasons. So we're in spring, and then we'll go through summer, and then autumn, and then winter. And I should set this over here because we're starting out in the first month of spring. Now, the first thing that happens in a month, in a round, is we determine who is going to be first player and how far they're going to be able to move in the market. I am currently the first player at the beginning of the game. You can tell because I'm at the top of the stack of player markers on the firefighting track. And so that means I get first dip. So I take my little, uh, my little marker here. And I can choose to move one, two, three, or four spaces in the market. Now, in a, if we were playing with more players, 
This space would be available as well, which means whoever comes here can move one, two, three, or four spaces. This gives you a lot of flexibility, but in a two-player game, this space is blocked. We can't actually use that. So I have to decide whether I'm going to move one, two, three, or four spaces in the market. Now, what that means is the market itself is a rondelle. This represents me, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces in the market. Every turn, I am going to move one, two, three, or four. So if I end up moving three spaces, so we start out here in this little side alley, but I would go one, two, three. And this is where I would end up, and these are the actions I could do. <clears throat> And uh, again, the board is kind of busy because it's based on, you know, again, this, this world famous mural, this, but it's definitely easy to see because you can see this is a section and then here's a little arrow saying this is a section. Here's an arrow saying this is a section. Here's an arrow saying this. And then the arrow continues. So we are always moving counterclockwise as we travel around in the market. And you know what? Actually, I think I will choose three. I'm going to move three spaces. And now the next player, which is Jen, she chooses. She cannot move three spaces. She can move one, two, or four. And if she could, she would move three, but I'm blocking that. So she cannot choose that space. So I think she will choose to move four spaces. Now, two things have happened. We've both determined how, where we are going to end up on the track. And we have also determined... Um, who is going to actually move through the market first. Furthest to the left goes first. I will go first because I'm at three and Jen's at four. If Jen had wanted to move first because she was in a hurry, she could have chosen the one or the two space and then she would have had first dibs. But as it is, I'll be, I'm going to continue to be the first player now and Jen is the second. Or I'll be the first player to act in the market and then Jen will be the second. And so now we can actually move in the market. Although before I move my big marker, three spaces to come over here. And I have to move exactly three. I can't move one or two or four. I have to move exactly three spaces. Spaces. But before I do that, I have an option. The first thing I do is I decide whether I'm going to hire one of these people to become an additional employee of mine or whether I'm not going to hire, in which case I can make four bucks or four mon, it's called. And that's a tough choice. But you know what? I think I am going to take advantage of the fact that I'm first out of the gate and I am going to hire this sake peddler because he's the cheapest guy. He only costs two bucks. Now we started with eight, so I'm going to pay two. And so I've hired this guy. And now I have to put him to work in one of the remaining stalls. Now, this marketplace is broken into four blocks. There's this one, this one, this one, and this one. And again, in a two-player game, these inner spaces are not available. We cannot build. That's why I've just used another player's marker to block these. We can never build in these spaces. If I were playing with more players and we could build, these are the most valuable spaces in the world because they cost two bucks to bit extra bucks to set up shop in these spaces. But again, in a two-player game, to tighten the board up, we cannot use them. So I could put my sake peddler right over here, right next door to Jen's guy. Uh, or I could put him over here or here you know, in the same market as my guy. Or I could put him over on one of these other blocks. And where I put this guy is very, very important because what happens is when you, when you put one of these people down and um, you know, what's going to happen in a, after I use the sake peddler, I'm going to move one, two, three spaces, right? Now, wherever you move, you get to do the action that's associated with the space you've ended up in. I'm in this space. And so my action is, this little icon right here is a reminder that I get to increase my skill in firefighting. And which is hugely important because three times over the course of the game, fire is going to spread through the market. And if I want to protect all my investments, I need to make sure I'm prepared to fight that fire. So coming over here, I'm going to be able to increase my firefighting skill. Plus, I have the option of visiting a, a merchant. In addition to doing the core action of this space, I can also visit you know, any of the merchants who have set up here. If I set up my own guy, then I could either visit Jen's boiled egg peddler or my sake peddler. Now the interesting thing is, whichever one of these two I would visit, the reward is I would get one food for free. Which is great because normally I have to come over here and pay one buck for food or I have to come over here and pay uh, what was it? Uh, three bucks for two food. So picking up food for free is a big deal because at the end of every season, I need to pay all my workers with food. I need to feed them all. So if I don't have food, they're going to quit, which is a real bummer. So coming over here and getting to do the core action plus a bonus action is really great. And the interesting thing is, if both Jen and I have a shop merchant here, I can choose to visit Jen's or mine. 
And what I would probably do is visit my own. I'd get my free food and I'd go on my way. I would have done the core action plus a bonus action. But say I don't have a worker here. When I come over here, I can, I can do the core action and I could visit Jen's merchant, which means I would get one food for free, totally for free, which is a big benefit, but Jen would get a benefit too. Every time I visit one of Jen's merchants, they become more experienced and they get closer and closer to retiring. Remember I mentioned the, the higher they go, the better they are for Jen. And if Jen could get this person retired, that can be a huge benefit for her, can actually score her points at the end of the game. So by me visiting Jen's merchant, I'll get something, but Jen will get something too. So that's why it might be tempting for me to put my own guy here so that when I stop here, I can visit my own guy instead of Jen's and not give her the benefit. But I think I've got something else in mind that is particularly useful as well. I am going to put my sake merchant, the, my new sake peddler, over here, or I'll put him over here, next door to my, or, you know, in the same little block as my eyeglasses guy. Now that means if, right now, if, I, if Jen ever visits this area or this area, in addition to doing the core action she could do in that space, she could visit one of my workers and then she'll get free food or two bucks and I'll get the benefit of increasing the ability of my guys. But there is another reason I put these together. At the end of the season, when, once we, you know, when we're, and we're having to pay our salaries and we're getting income and stuff like that, another thing is we have the opportunity to score bonus points if there are merchants in the same block who are the same type of merchant. I, I forget, there's a specific word for what this bonus is. Jen and I, we just call it like a harmony bonus because these two guys who are both the yellow type of card working in the same area, and since they both belong to me, that will score me bonus points. So, um, in addition to trying to put your merchants in places where you think players are going to visit so that you can get a benefit, although other players get a benefit too, you also want to kind of match colors so that you can score bonus points. So now that I've got two yellow guys in this block, I'm going to score... Um, basically, every yellow guy in this block is worth two points because there's two yellow guys. And since I've got two yellow guys, that's two times two. This is going to score me four points at the end of the season. So while it would be nice to come over here so that I could visit this area and not benefit Jen, I'm, I think instead I'm going to group my guys together so that I can score bonus points. If I can hire another yellow guy and put him over here, then there's three guys here. And so each one of them is worth three points. Three, my three guys times three points each means I could get nine points every season if I could get that many matching merchants in this area. So anyway, now all of that was the first half of my turn. Remember, the first thing I do is I either choose to hire somebody, which I did, and I had to pay, uh, you know, the, the hiring, and then I install them someplace that's open. Obviously, and you can't install here. I can't install someplace where somebody's already set up. And then I do my movement. I'm going to move three spaces now. One, two, three, and my reward here is I get to, as I said earlier, improve my firefighting potential. And now I don't have to do this. But I will. I will take one food from Jen's boiled egg peddler. And Jen is very happy about that because that means, boom, her boiled egg peddler just became a level two. And um, while I'm not happy about that, it was definitely worth it because now I've got two food. I don't necessarily have to worry about stopping over in this, you know, in um, this area or this area to pick up more food to feed my people because at the end of the season I need two food to feed these two people. So I've now got two food thanks to Jen's market. And you know that's a really big part of the game, the synergy between players because everybody affects everybody else in this game. So anyway, that was my turn. I moved my three spaces, but first I hired somebody. Now Jen, she's gonna move four spaces, but before she does that, she has a choice. Does she want to hire one of these remaining three? And I don't think so. I think instead, Jen's just going to take four bucks, so she has more cash on hand. Um, because these other ones are more expensive. This guy costs three, three, and four. I got the only cheap one. And the thing is, if these guys don't get hired, over time, they get more and more desperate for work, and they will get cheaper and cheaper to hire. So Jen's not going to hire any of them at full price. She's going to wait. So instead, Jen just got four more bucks. And now she gets to move one, two, three, four spaces, and she has come over here. 
And now the interesting thing is, there nobody's been set up in this little stall, so Jen only gets to do one action in this area. If Jen had wanted, she and she could have hired somebody. She could have hired the monk and put and installed him here. And then when Jen visited this place, she would get you know the benefit, which is uh, buying some tobacco and pipes. But she would also get a free improvement to her firefighting, which would be interesting because then that would put her. She'd move on forward, and whoever's on top is going to be first player next round. So if Jen had hired, ooh, that is interesting. Maybe Jen doesn't want to do it. She, she wants to, but she really doesn't want to because she would like to get four bucks instead, so she has more money for later. Because you need a lot of money to build these buildings, which are worth a lot of points as well. And you spend money on other stuff as well, like more sandals and more food, and, um, and so on. I mean, so, oh, should Jen hire that monk Instead of taking this four bucks, Jen could have hired the monk because then when she visited here, she would have gotten a benefit from him. Um, and then she could hope next turn that maybe I would visit here and so I could get the benefit and he would level up and get closer to retiring. So that's really interesting for Jen too. No, but she's not going to do it. She's instead, she's going to take the money. Yeah, must be the money. All right, so she took the money instead. She didn't hire anybody. She's going to wait for this guy to get a little bit cheaper before she hires him. So she's moved her four spaces. Now, an interesting thing is Jen has to move exactly four spaces because that's what she chose on the turn track. But Jen has sandals. Everybody at the beginning of the game has one pair of sandals. You can use these sandals to move additional spaces. So if Jen wanted to, she could spend this sandal to move an additional fifth space. So she'd be over here and get to do this action where she can turn money or sandals into, or I'm sorry, food or sandals into money. Now Jen's not going to do that. She'll save the sandals for when she's really desperate to make a big move. So she's come over here. She gets no bonus action because there's nobody who set up shop there. And now the interesting thing is, if I'd wanted to, I could have set my guy up over here. Remember, I was thinking about setting my guy up. I was thinking about over here. If I'd set my guy up over here, I knew Jen was going to move four spaces. So if I'd set up my sake peddler over here, I knew it was very likely Jen would land here and maybe I'd get to level him up. But instead, I'm choosing to move this guy over here so I can get the little harmony bonus of having regular, guy, um, you know, matching colors in the same area. That's the other thing too. If I had put this guy over here, since there's two yellows. At the end of the season, each one of these yellows is worth two points. That means Jim would get two points and I get two points because we each have one. But I'm just trying to get a monopoly on yellow merchants over here. So that means I missed out on my chance because I could have put it here because I knew this is where Jen was going to move because she had already chosen that. But anyway, so Jen's come over here. She's not going to get any bonus action, but she is going to do a core action, which is Jen could buy one pipe, one pouch of tobacco, or one of each. You know, either or. You know, one or the other or both. And Jen, in fact, since she just made four bucks instead of hiring somebody, Jen's going to pay six bucks and she's going to get one of each. She's going to get the first pouch of tobacco, which is worth two points at the end of the game. And she is going to get um, the first pipe, which, and you know, each of these cost her three bucks. Now, a pipe isn't worth any points at the end of the game, but whenever you get a pipe, a benefit is you increase your firefighting skill by one. So Jen has just uh, increased her firefighting skill just like I did. I got to do it for free. Jen had to pay two bucks. But there's another advantage to pipes, which is if you have a pipe, all you need is just one pipe. That means every tobacco you have at the end of the game is doubled in value. So because Jen has a pipe, this uh, tobacco is actually worth four points. So Jen has just effectively paid six bucks to score four points at the end of the game. Plus, she increased her firefighting, although she didn't get any bonus free action. But it, she thinks it was worth it because as time goes on, these uh, remaining pipes and tobacco, they just get more and more and more expensive. All right. So that was Jen's turn. She didn't hire anybody. She made some money. She moved four spaces. And that was it, folks. That was the end of the first season. If there were more players, they would get to go and do stuff as well. But as it is, we are now going to move on to the second season. And, um, oh wait, oh wait, no, no, no. There's one more thing. In a two-player game, this is only a two-player game, before we move on to the second season, at the end of a season, there is a dummy player who in odd turns is controlled by the first player in even turns is controlled by the second player. So this turn, the dummy player is controlled by me. And that means all the dummy player does is, is take one of the uh, people who are still available to be hired but haven't been hired and takes them and hires them and installs them somewhere. And that's all the dummy player ever does. It just puts more workers out on the board to represent other players doing this. So I could put Yamabushi, the sandal maker, or the monk somewhere on the board. Uh, let's see here. And I think I will. Although here's an interesting problem. 
Because Jen has now increased her firefighting potential, that means Jen is going to be the first player next round. And, you know, say if I take the monk and I put him over here, that means Jen gets first dibs on being able to come over here and visit this guy and get his special power, which is increase your firefighting potential even more. So, because Jen's in the lead, and she's further along on the rondelle, wherever I put this guy, it's more likely that Jen is going to visit him. But, and yo, know, for the dummy players, once they get visited, they're gone. They just disappear. They only stick around for once. Our, a human-controlled merchant sticks around and levels up over time, but the dummy-controlled merchants, they just get used once and disappear. So, I have to pick one of these guys. I have to put him somewhere. But, I don't want to pick one that, since Jen's in first place, I, she's going to benefit from more than me. So, I think I'll take... I'll take this sandal maker guy because he's really not that exciting. He basically his if you visit him, you can spend two bucks to get two sandals, which is really I mean that's the core thing you do over here anyway. And I'll just go on ahead and put him. I don't know. I'll put him uh, over here because that means in the future if I come back over here instead of getting free food and helping Jen, I can visit him to get some more sandals. And so it's nice to have some an alternative when I come here, so that I don't have to help level up Jen's guy again. So. Now, anybody who didn't get hired at the end of the season, like I said, gets a bit more desperate. So they have both dropped their hiring cost by one. And over time, they can get cheaper and cheaper to the point where they're even for free. And the last thing that happens at the end of the round is always four new people come out. So we got the ox cart, the seamstress, the kite maker, and the carpenter. And so that was the end of the first season. Now we move on to season two. Jen's in first place on the fire marking track. So she will get to be the first player to choose how far she's going to move. And that means she gets first dibs at all the different actions that are on the board. And what will she do? Well, if you'd like to find out, you can hit the little I up in the top right corner of the screen to go to the extended playthrough because I will play through at least... I don't know, probably two, probably up to five more rounds because I'd like to demonstrate how fire works as well. On the fifth round, January, February, March, April, May, in May, there is going to be a fire. And so we have to be prepared for that, which is why we're increasing our firefighting potential. But at the end of March, we are going to have the end of season stuff where we get income from our people, but we also have to feed them food or else they quit. So there's still a lot to see in this game. If you'd like, you can hit the little I, go to the extended playthrough, or alternative, you can go to final thoughts, your choice in five, four. Four, three, two, one.